I'm Weston Lee, and I'm here having a chance to inaugurate a series called Big Ribbon Stores. Uh, my name is Vivek Madala, and I'm a composer, producer, engineer. I was always interested in studying electrical engineering, and also I was very interested in music. And um, when I was 15, I went to the Berklee College of Music in Boston to be a jazz drummer. And um, I came to realize, you know, the, with the proliferation of drum machines, unless I was, you know, Steve Gadd, like, or Vinnie Colaiuta, probably that wasn't a wise career choice. Um, and I was a pretty competent drummer, but I was not, I was no Vinnie Colaiuta. And I had a good background in math and physics, and I ended up going to engineering school. And so when I was 16, I went to Georgia Tech and I studied electrical engineering, actually double major electrical engineering and, and economics. And then um, um, eventually I, yeah, I, I ended up taking a, a position with uh, Tektronix uh, in Portland, Oregon as a hardware design engineer. Um, and then a short stint, um, I, I, you know, with the rock band Boston. Ended up um, taking a position with Dolby Laboratories um, uh, as, an, as an engineer. And really what I wanted to be doing was making music the entire time. I I, I felt a bit like, um, you know, I was putting all this time and attention into engineering, but really what I wanted to do was play in bands and, and make music. And I was really interested in film and, and the way in which music can help tell, uh, you know, a dramatic story. And in 2000, there was a national competition for film scoring, uh, co-sponsored by Guitar Center and, and Warner Brothers, Sharon Classic Movies. So I entered the competition and I won the grand prize, which was a movie deal with Warner Brothers. And so um, I scored uh, my first, it was actually a silent film restoration from the 1920s um, for Turner Classic Movies. And then that was successful enough that they made me kind of a quasi resident composer. And so I scored a number of, I think six, six different films for them and started doing uh, independent films as well. Um, in the early, I guess around, 2005 to 2007, I also took a position with uh, M Audio, uh, designing loudspeaker. You know, working on their loudspeakers and microphones in, in um, for Avid Audio, and ultimately, you know, the whole reason to move to LA was to was to score films, and so I essentially found my way back into scoring films full time. And uh, in 2008, I, I did the, uh, the Sundance, I got the Sundance Film Scoring uh, uh, Fellowship for the Composers Lab. And, uh, and I've been scoring films kind of full time ever since and playing in bands and producing records for other artists. Um, I started doing more television and animation around 2015, 2016. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's, that's kind of where I am now. I'm, I'm mainly, mainly scoring films, um, doing some television as well. Um, a lot of documentaries, a lot of uh, animation, some live action stuff, and producing records for other artists. And I also play on other, uh, on scores for other composers as well. So, um, you know, you kind of have to patch together a living from a variety of sources. And it also makes it, makes it fun, makes it interesting. And the room we're in has yeah. all these instruments. <laughs> And it's incredibly quiet. Yeah, um, we spent about three, three and a half years um, designing and, and building this room um, along with the mains. And uh, yeah, this is where I work. This is where I spend about 16 hours a day. Um, and it's this room is kind of peculiarly designed to how I work. So all the instruments that I play, all the, the guitars, drums, uh, keyboards, bass, um, Everything is always mic'd up and ready to go. The piano the piano room is always mic'd up and ready to go. Uh, the live room is usually ready to go. Um, I've got mics in here for vocals, for strings. Um, drums are always ready to go. So whenever I have an idea, um, I don't have to really overcome a lot of inertia <laughs> to realize that idea. Um, all I have to do is enable a track and I can start recording. This is a lot like some very traditional facilities. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I think when you're a creative person and you have a musical idea, it's nice to be able to just capture it in the moment. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm trying to do here. Um, 
if I have everything ready to go, then I don't really have to sort of turn off my creative brain and get into technical technical mode just to figure out how to mic up an amp and run the cables and you know set the mic pre's and so on. Everything's kind of always ready to go. Now there are some things um, because I don't have the resources of say an Evergreen or Linda Perry. Um, I have, for example, one drum kit. I've got a couple of kits, but this is my main recording kit and it's designed, it's sort of set up to be maximally flexible. So I've got a 20 inch kick. Um, so if I want to go for more of a bebop sort of Elvin Jones sound, I can put, I can tune the, tune the drum up. Um, I can put a, a solid head on the, on the resonant side and kind of get that bebop sound. I can, I can tune up the, the, the heads on the toms. I've got coated um, ambassadors. And I can get that sort of vintage bebop sound. If I want more of a, a modern rock sound, um, I can put a ported head on here. I could switch them out pretty quickly. Right now there's a ported head. Tune, I can tune the drums down as low as they'll go. This 20 inch can sound pretty massive. Um, 20 inch uh, Gretsch maple uh, kick drum. Uh, 10, 12, 14 inch toms can sound pretty, pretty big as well. When I tune them down to the lowest note that they'll produce. Uh, I've got a variety of snares, and again, the idea is maximum flexibility. Um, right now, I've got a uh, a Black Beauty set up, a six and a half by fourteen Black Beauty, which has a huge, a very wide tuning range. So, if I want to make it sound like a timbale, I can with the snares off, I can turn it way up and do that. If I want that vintagey sort of seventies dull thud, like the you know that sort of Al Green backbeat, I can get that as well. Um, so I have a, a bunch of different symbol options, different ways of mounting microphones as overheads. So right now I've got an ORTF uh, set up up there, but if I want to do a Glyn John system or space pair or something, you know, XY, something else, it's pretty easy for me to just, I don't have to haul out a bunch of stands. I've got, I've got the mic mounts already in the ceiling. So the idea is to kind of, you know, be as, as quick and flexible as possible. So, you know, as, as a, as a film composer and as not a, not a wealthy one, um, I had, you know, fairly limited resources. And so the idea was how much can we do with limited resources and limited space? So like this particular room is designed both for, for critical listening and, and it's also neutral and, and appropriate for tracking. So tracking single instruments or, you know, I've, Actually, at one point, I even had a string quartet in here, but generally it's it's one instrument at a time. We'll go to the live room uh, for it for more players. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of wanted this room to be essentially a place where I can comfortably and enjoyably score films. Um, the reason we're using this Diapolito vertical array for the loudspeakers, for the, the mains, is that, you know, as you know, you can be off axis so generally when you're, when you're, when you're listening to loudspeakers, let's say a stereo pair, you want to position yourself at the apex of an isosceles triangle between the two speakers to get a proper stereo image, or ideally it's an equilateral triangle. But if you're off axis, it screws up the stereo image, right? So this way, if I've very often, I'll, I'll have a, a director in here and an editor of like a film that I'm scoring. And normally everyone would have to sort of take turns sitting in the sweet spot to get a proper representation of the score. Um, but because, because I'm using these, this Diapolito vertical array, uh, I get a wider sweet spot. You can actually be off axis and still get a pretty reasonable stereo image. So that's kind of the main reason why I went with that type of configuration. Um, I designed these um, speakers a few years ago um, that are also based on a, uh, a Diapolito. Well, array. these are the Avid speakers, the, the yeah, audio ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I worked on those, um, gosh, many, many years ago. And I came to really just love that the, the Diapolito, um, what, what that does for you in terms of the beam steering, in terms of getting a wider sweet spot. So uh, when it came time to getting the, the mains for this room, I, I really wanted to go with the Diapolito vertical array. Um, the, the cool thing about this particular room also is that everything is, is within reach. Um, and the studio itself is wired up to the, to the live room and is also wired up to the house where I have the piano room. And so it's, um, you know, it allows me to, to 
basically anything that I want to record, I can pretty much do it here unless it's a large orchestra, um, in which case I'd have to go to scoring stage. But for the vast majority of the work that I do, which is mostly chamber size groups, um, you know, double string quartet, woodwind quintet, anything that's say fewer than um, fewer than 20 players, I can record here. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> a lovely for the footprint this has and the solar powering and all that. The, the amount of detail that went into this facility is stunning to me. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, there are certain things that I made a lot of mistakes when we were designing this room that we had to fix and correct. Um, one of the things, so we, I have a separate machine room. So anything that generates noise is in that separate machine room that's a separate temperature and humidity controlled environment and it's acoustically isolated. But um, as I mentioned, because mostly what I'm doing is scoring films, um, I have a, a screen that comes down and I've got a projector. Now, as you know, the projector is gonna generate noise because there's cooling fans. And so I built an ISO box um, uh, working with Rick Olson, uh, who's a, actually a fantastic uh, uh, electrician and kind of a, great at a lot of different things. We built this ISO box to be, to basically make the projector completely silent that would contain all this, all the, all the, the fan noise. Now, of course you have to exhaust the hot air out. So we have a, um, we have a duct that's feeding cold air from the machine room through the ceiling into the uh, projector. And then we're sucking out using an inline fan, the hot air. And once we got that to be completely silent, by the way, that turned out to be a whole project because I realized that you needed two different panes of glass with two different thicknesses at two different angles. Like I think I've got three eighths of an inch at 17 degrees and five eighths of an inch at nine and a half degrees in order to minimize edge, you know, the like light diffraction. There's all these things well, we had to figure different, out. Different weights for different uh, resonant frequencies. Yeah. So in, in the that, case that's really important. Well, different angles totally. because you don't want it to have a resonance of the airspace between. Well, cer that. Certainly for sound. Yeah, yeah. But also for light, it turns out that there are all these these considerations we had to we had to account for. Turns out that we could hear the um, the sound of the inline fan in the ceiling, and then. Um, what I found was that for every 90 degree bend in the duct, I was getting roughly 3 dB of noise attenuation. So there's another machine room behind this wall where I basically snaked it as many times as I could before it hits the outside. So I think I have 15 90 degree bends between the projector and the outside. So, so now it's, which is 45 dB of attenuation roughly. So it's now completely silent. So there's no difference. You can't really hear the projector now. Um, and then we use the same principle for the HVAC system. So the HVAC system is completely silent. Um, so when the air kicks on, there's no difference in the noise floor. Um, what we're doing is we're moving air very, very slowly. Um, and the, um, essentially the, the registers have all these sort of radius edges so that to minimize air friction noise. So the air just falls. And again, this way, there's, there's no, I don't have to worry about whether the air is on or not when I'm recording. So I spent so many years like, you know, <laughs> having to turn off the air, the air conditioning whenever we have to, to do a take. And sometimes you forget and you get a great take, but then the noise floor is an issue. The devil is in the detail. <laughs> and that's why I am, I'm having built facilities from my first one, which was a great fun place to listen. But when we recorded uh, Dry City Scout Band, and it had some very good players, David Lindley and Richard Green. Wow. Um, I realized, oh, I, I should have put the things I'd seen on scoring stages. I needed uh, polycylindrical diffusers uh -huh. so they would hear themselves better. Because right. I had just made a place that's A7500s driven by some nice Marantz 2 amps, sounded really good. Mm -hmm. But that's not a recording studio. That's a playback room. And that's what Wally Heider taught me. Yeah. He said, uh, for, if you're interested in recreative, then what you're interested in doing is make a room that people like to play in. Yeah. And record from the moment anybody's playing till nobody's playing. Right. 
and that allows them to just walk in like this and play. Yeah, yeah. So this is in the center of the universe. It's in a very small space um, because that's what most of us can afford to build. Yeah. But the amount of thoughtfulness that went into this is astounding. <laughs> Thank you. And you learn things by doing things. And I yeah. know that you've done a lot at this point. So what was the first thing you did with those kept speakers that got you into all this? So those kept speakers, um, I think, um, right. So th those are sort of like the, the speakers in, in our living room when I was a kid. And I think we bought them, uh, it was probably around 1984, 85. So I think it was around 10 years old. And um, so I was, I don't know if this is unusual. Maybe this is not unusual for, for someone from my generation. Maybe it's unusual today, but I spent a lot of time just listening to records, listening to albums. A lot, you know, at the time CDs were, were becoming more popular. Um, just sitting there in the sweet spot between the two speakers listening and and putting 100% of my CPU <laughs> to what I was listening to. I think a lot of the way people listen to music these days is it's sort of incidental, like they'll listen while they're cooking or while they're doing something else. And music is kind of like one of the things that's sort of accompanying them on their ride. They say it's their favorite activity. Uh -huh. But it's not that they make music. It's not that they are giving it all their CPU power yeah. and appreciating it. It's it's the background track. Yeah. And I understand that. If I don't have an underscore, how do I know how I feel? <laughs> yeah. So I you know, I spent a lot of time as a kid, hours and hours, just listening to music. I might have been leading, reading the, the liner notes maybe of the album, yeah. but pretty much just listening to the music and immersing myself in in the world that that created um and the vast majority of my listening was on those speakers um so to me that sort of became what sounded correct <laughs> um years later actually when i started scoring films here in la um my there's a there's an engineer in town who i love who i love working with named dan blessinger he's actually kind of not too far from me he's not too far from Pasadena. Um, and he uses the, the, um, the uh, Manly dual, con it's a Tannoy dual concentric, yeah. I guess it's called, what is it, the SG-10 or something, with the Manly cabinets, with the, the Doug Sachs Mastering Lab crossovers. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I started listening to, to music that I was creating on those speakers, that kind of became my new gold standard. Like to me, those, I think George Bassenberg uses those. It's there, it's a, it's a, um, uh, I guess it's a fairly common um, speaker that you'll find in in high end studios here in LA and maybe in Nashville. Um, those are they're passive, so often they're paired up with like a Bryston amp or something, and they just sound they sound beautiful and very expository to me. Like I can hear flaws, I can hear things in the music that I maybe wouldn't be able to hear on other speakers. And so that became kind of, for me, like the asymptote that I was trying to approach when, when developing speakers myself. Um, so I would frequently compare things to, to those speakers. Now, the KEF still sound correct to me. Um, and of course, the room makes a huge difference, right? Because you're hearing not just the speakers, but you're hearing the effect you're of hearing the room. reflections. Yeah, in the room. The so it's a combination of the two things. Um, but still, the, there's something magical to me about about the those uh, tannoys as well, and it's one of the reasons I really like the um, the EX sixty sixes, the the speakers for Avid that I worked on, as well as these uh, Diablito vertical arrays that I'm using here, is because they they kind of give me the same thing. Um, they're lovely to listen to, but they're also very expository, and I can I can they give me what I need in order to make accurate judgment calls about what I'm what I'm hearing. Um, I do very often go back and put mixes up on the on those cap speakers as well, and just check them in you know on those caps. And if they sound correct to me, then I I probably have a good mix. And and so like I got to tell you, I spent just a lot of 
time as a kid listening to music and um you know it's kind of maybe this is an odd thing to say but i i've always i think i've always thought not just like like a composer but also as a producer so i would hear i would hear music that was coming out um at the time and i would hear what you know what things would i do differently um one of my earliest memories, you're going to laugh when you hear this. <laughs> one of my earliest memories, I think I might have been maybe three or four years old, and we were in a taxi cab. I was with my parents and my sister. And I think the, the cab driver had like a Bee Gees tune on the radio. And I remember thinking to myself, there's too many 16th notes. I think it was that song, Staying a Lot, you know, Feel the City Breaking and Everybody Shaking. It had this like rhythmic 16th note, these parallel lines. And it's a, maybe a silly observation, but at the time I was thinking there's just too, I didn't, I didn't know what a 16th note was. I just thought that the syncopation was too busy. And that was just a judgment that I made in my own head as a three-year-old or whatever. And I remember being a kid, like, I don't know, middle school and thinking, you know, I don't like the way that snare drum sounds on that record, or I really do like it, you know, um, or like me, you know, in the eighties, as you know, the gated reverb snare thing was a big deal. And I remember thinking, well, they're just, they're just taking that too far. Like, <laughs> it's 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 re it's like almost a caricature of the old gated, you know, gated reverb snare. Why why do they do that? And so I would hear what revisions I would make to the music, and you know, in my head, or they're 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 sitting on that chord too long. They really you know need to pivot har harmonically to something else. It would be better that way. And so I think at some point I came to realize that I somehow this was hardwired <laughs> into who I am that like, I think like a producer. Um, so when I'm, when I'm creating music in my head or when I'm sitting at a piano writing something, I generally hear it fully orchestrated and not just fully orchestrated, but like, I know what the timbre of the bass is supposed to sound like in my head or what I think it's, it should sound like. Um, I have a sense of how I want the vocals to sit in the mix, where I want things to be panned in the stereo field. Um, it's funny, this is actually kind of what brought me originally a few years ago to be interested in, in ribbon mics. Um, and specifically the idea, well, it was a couple of things. One, the, sort of the, the, the tonal shape, the timbral, there was something very natural about the sound of ribbons that I came to understand, which I didn't get at first. Um, and there's something very gentle about them um and then the idea that you're dealing with figure eight uh polar patterns and so you can do you know i i came to become a, a big fan of the the blum line recording technique um because of the, the way you get a very very natural stereo presentation with also really good mono mix compatibility because it's a coincident um a coincident liking technique um and i found that i with ribbon mics, I could more easily achieve the sound I was hearing in my head. Well, one of the things about that coincident uh -huh. uh, blue line technique is when you collapse it to mono, it becomes a figure eight aimed at the center point. Yeah. And it just does that because whenever you're working with figure eights and you collapse them, all that it does is change the angle. Mm -hmm. So the sort of MS stereo, you can rotate it 45 degrees and run a front figure eight, a side figure eight. Mm -hmm. And as you hit your MS, your mix, mm -hmm. all that happens is it rotates the center point if you're treating it that way. Um, and it's, it's a very consistent sound yeah. change. The the first time I used the N8, uh, AEA N8 mics in a Blum line in a recording situation, I was struck by, well, essentially what, precisely what you're, what you're talking about, the way that you can, you can um, really preserve a natural, uh, a nat you know, uh, natural presentation by folding down by by panning the um the mics within the stereo field but the the first time i used it it was with a a solo clarinetist and he was um 
he was standing, he was kind of moving around like this. It was sort of just the way he, the way he plays. He was, there was a lot of movement and I basically just had a, um, a couple of N8s in a Blum line, you know, I don't know, maybe three feet away from in front of them. And I was, I was wondering, like, I wonder what's going to happen here <laughs> when I play this back. Is it going to be weird? And we played it back over the mains and it, it, it really didn't require anything. It, it fit perfectly in the mix. I soloed those two mics and it was like Zach, the clarinet, it was like he was standing right in front of me. I could feel the air around him and his physical movement was preserved in the stereo image. It, it didn't get all phasey and weird. It didn't timbrely. It didn't, it didn't like, it didn't sound like he was, it just had a very, very natural sound. And then I was like, wow, I got to try this on other things. <laughs> and so like, I, I've used, I've used it quite a lot on piano in the, the, the curve. So the, I don't know what it's called, but the little curve of the piano yeah. of, of grand piano kind of in that curve facing the hammers. Um, I can get a beautiful classic, like a classical sound, which is different than what I normally do because I normally have omnis that are fairly close to the hammers. Yeah, um, I call that the pocket of the piano. The pocket, the pocket. Yeah, just get it in the pocket. Yeah, um, I use it for 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 drums. There's something that's just very natural about the way. Uh, it's almost like the Blum line and the ORTF are kind of my two favorite stereo miking techniques now. Um, I guess because they just sound like what I'm hearing when I'm in the room. One of the things that I do when I'm miking a new instrument, like let's say I have somebody comes in with something I've never done before, even if it's an instrument that I've miked a million times, like say a steel string acoustic guitar or something. Um, what I like to do is kind of, you know, it's a different player, it's a different instrument, maybe we're in a different room, although typically I might be just doing something like that in here. I'll actually just crawl around and wherever the tone seems kind of sweet to me, a mic goes there, right? And what I found was, if I take my N8 Blumline pair, wherever my head, wherever I'm like, this, this is a really <laughs> sweet tone, that's where, I stick, that's where I stick the mic. And it's not, I mean, it's maybe a boneheaded way to go about it. No, it's, it's what Les Paul ta taught me. Really? <laughs> Find where it sounds good, put it there. And then Christopher Stone, the uh -huh. composer, when I put him onto our mics, yeah. He said, well, they always sound good, often better than anything I've ever heard, and they always fit in the mix. Yeah. And I, I, that's what I leave up in my li live room like this that he yeah. had next to his hundred and some channel cockpit of Pro Tools. And he said, I work with them because if what you're working with is recreative, this yeah. is the fastest thing. And I yeah. have to work fast. Right. So, right, technology can be really fun. And sometimes it's, it's for me, I find it's easy to get um, sort of enamored with how cool the tools are. Um, and, you know, I have to think that like a digital audio workstation really is kind of a glorified screwdriver. It's a tool that helps me achieve the music that I have in my head. Um, you know, I think of things like microphones and mic preamps as being like the the, the paintbrushes uh, that, that we use to create the, the paintings. But because there's, you know, they're so fun and they're so interesting in themselves, it's like sometimes the paintbrushes <laughs> end up attracting a lot of my attention because I, you know, they're so beautifully made and constructed in, in a way. It's like there's that's kind of art as well. It's like the paintbrushes themselves are a work of art, and then you're using these works of art to create another work of art. Um, anyway, it's just something I, I've, I've observed, and I have to continually kind of stay on top of it and not get distracted by how cool the tools are. I mean, microphones in particular, because they, um, I, I mean, all the tools that we use are, are a kind of paintbrush, I suppose. You know, um, you know an instrument is, is a kind of a, a paintbrush as well. Um, but yeah, there's something there's something about microphones that for me, uh, I don't know. There's there's something magical about them. Um, and I guess maybe going back to Tesla and, and Bell and Edison, you know, there's 
there's something about the the fact that it's a you know a fundamentally an electromechanical device um, that I find really uh, intellectually stimulating in a way that other kinds of tools aren't. Um, and I don't know, I, I have to probably interrogate that a bit and see see what's behind that. To me, it seems like there's kind of two general schools of thought with respect to recording. One is the idea of documenting a, a live performance. In other words, capturing it as it was heard in the room. And then the other is sort of the other end of the spectrum would be where you're creating from the ground up an experience that didn't actually happen. Well, right? that's, so, that's the whole thing about... So like Pet Sounds being like maybe an early example of that, yeah. you know, or a lot of the stuff the Beatles were doing, um, starting Peppers and so on, um, which, you know, of course, throughout the, the 70s, a lot of the classic rock albums were basically built from the ground up, not as documentations of an existing performance, but rather sort of concept. You've told me a bit about the innate bloom line. Yeah. What you haven't mentioned anything about, but you have, I see one, two, three, four of our uh, AEA. Uh, the mic preamps, yeah. The RPQ500s and the TRP500s. Could yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the RPQ500s, I got, um, I think I bought them in 2015, specifically for use with the R88. Um, and um i was pretty blown away they they the fact that you can get that much gain with such little noise you know basically no no noise and distortion um was pretty surprising to me i, I forget it was like is it it's 84 dB of 84 dB of gain wow yeah. okay i was not going to guess a number that high but um and then i started using them for dynamic mics uh, I mean, for like not, sorry, originally the R88, then the then the N8s, which are active ribbons. Different transformer. Yep. And then with a phantom powered unit to gain JFET buffer, so they could drive really long um, mic lines at sure. 100 ohms. So that it handles being on festival stages where the front of house is 200 feet. Yeah, at least. From so, and the JFET buffer basically gives you a very high input impedance, very low output impedance, right? Yeah, because yeah. we're we're now coming off a one to one ten transformer. Yeah, it's just a stunningly good German. Yeah, toroid, and um, that means I'm coming out at four or five k. Yeah, instead of about two hundred and seventy ohms. Yeah, and I don't want to run four or five k for any length of cable. Because then the cable capacitance, right. the inductance, sometimes you wind up with more than 200 feet of cable and you definitely don't, you know, yeah. it will strongly influence the sound in the same way that using a Neve preamp strongly influences sure. the sound. So, so the, my main colors then became the RPQ 500 um, for just basically a lot of gain, super clean, super transparent. And then I, I had my, my BAE 1073s as sort of a completely different color for different yeah. for different use. And then I think it was maybe, so the RPQ500 was kind of like my favorite mic pre for years. And then I got an email message from you where you mentioned that you had this other mic pre coming out, the TRP500, but I'd be interested in checking it out. Um, I think I was in the middle, I think I was in the middle of three film scores at the time and I just yeah. did not have the time to, you know, um, I didn't have the bandwidth. You to, have to. Do to it. A so, lot of times <laughs> you can't experiment with anything because time is the time is of the essence. Yeah. And so um, eventually, when I had a break, I um, came to your office, and I asked why I met with uh, Joey Krieger, right? Yes. And um, I was curious, but I I was really into my RPQ five hundreds. Well, so they're very like, good. They're very good. So I was like, well, I mean, okay, well, what is this other thing? So I, I brought him into the studio and started doing some tests. And um, I found that they had, I guess, I guess they have a higher input impedance, right? Than even the RPQ500. Because the well, RPQ500 was something like, what, 20K input impedance? Well, with Phantom Power, they're about 10, 11K. Okay. Um, without Phantom Power, uh, they're all 33 
36K or more. Okay. And we've gradually gotten them up. I think the um, probably the RPQ uh, 500 and the TRP 500 are both about 66K. So I've, I've actually been using the TRP 500s now, both as a ribbon mic pre, but also for other mics, including uh, small diaphragm condenser mics. I've been using them for uh, mini capacitor mics. Um, uh, on the Sputnik, I've been using the TRP500 on the what I microphone found. you designed yeah, for so your voice. Yeah, yeah. It's it's actually kind of like a cross between a U47 and a C12. It, yeah. The capsule has integrates elements of both the original M7 capsule from Neumann and the CK12 capsule. The AKG CK12 capsule. The head amp is loosely based on the ELA M251. Um, and um, mostly I was using my Neve style preamps, my BAE 1073s for that. And now um, my favorite preamp for that mic is the TRP 500. Um, I've also been using it for kick drum on as a for my uh, uh, main kick. I've actually got two different mics on my kick drum. Um, and I've been using the TRP 500 for that. Um, I'm using it in in situations and with mics that I hadn't planned on, and it just performs beautifully. It's it, it's almost like it's invisible gain. It's gain without imparting any coloration that I can discern. Um, and that's an extremely useful thing to have. It is. I've been told similar things from a variety of people. Um, the thing that keeps coming up is one person said, the term musical gain is overused. But in this particular case, it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. And what some people, that, that sort of sound I was talking about with a Deutsche gramophone uh -huh. orchestral recordings. Um, or other times when it comes out hi-fi. And that's not a natural sound. That's a sound of, oh, I could hear all this extra detail. Yeah. And what the people have told me is they like that you get the extra detail, but it doesn't sound hyped in any way. They didn't get it, it by hype. It doesn't feel artificial. It, feels just yeah. sudden, it just has more resolution. Yeah. And I think of this meaning it, meaning it has detail without feeling exaggerated. Yeah, yeah. And the and the th reason the thing people have told me, like I mentioned earlier, as they say, uh, we, we became aware that if we use that at the same loudness, it's, it's no difference on the Pro Tools or the, um, but so the mat they know they match the levels perfectly. But what they found was with the other preamp that they had been using, they would touch a little bit of compression to bring it up, mm -hmm. to bring it forward. And that they heard with no compression, the uh, recording the instrument mm -hmm. as well as using their previous favorite with compression. Mm -hmm. And that between having compression and not, they always would go for no compression. Sure. It just sounded better. Yeah. And those are the sort of, when I started getting that feedback, I went, okay, these are pretty careful people. They're they're just lining up to be exact, you know, what some things you can do in the yeah. box. Well, it, I mean, it is interesting. Like for me, using the N8s in a Blum line configuration into the TRP 500, D regardless of what I'm recording, I'm less likely to use EQ and I'm less likely to use compression. Yeah. Um, I tend to, I mean, there are times when you can use equalization for an, for an effect. Yeah. Um, but most of the time I'm, I use like subtractive EQing if I'm trying to fix a problem. And I find that most of the time I don't need to use any EQ. If I've positioned, if I've placed the mic properly, <laughs> meaning it, it, you know, it, it's... Just like Wally said. Yeah, if... <laughs> If, if, and by properly, I mean in a, in a way that makes sense musically. I said, I want to collect stories directly told by people instead of trying to tell them later. So thank you so much for participating in the 
inauguration of what um, Luke and I call the Big Ribbon Story. Well, thank you for inviting me and, and for talking to me about this. It's really fun. Oh, I, it's a joy to do this. I've learned so much, and I thought I knew a little bit about you, and I now know a little bit more. Thank you. 